The, now, the, your, your second point, that there's, a, that, that there's no sharp boundary around certain entities such as the brain, I think you do not mean the serious. There, there's obviously a boundary around, the, or, or the brain ends somewhere, and, uh, and maybe the nerves go out to the end of the body somewhere, but then there is a, a limit to that. Of course, uh, our input is not limited to what touches our, our skin, but we, we receive signals from uh, as far as we can see. Uh, not so far if you're short-sighted. So, um, and now, now the um, uh, so, so, but, but there, there, there are these, there are these kind of bound boundaries. Even though we are, uh, we, uh, we these, you, you, you may be right in saying it's the same fabric: the brain, the body, and the world. Uh, it, there, there are different, clearly different things. And I think a bridge between the world and the and, and the brain is the action of the brain, or actually not the brain, of the person, and uh, which, uh, which, actually, uh, which actually has a component of activation in the brain and uh, body movement and, of course, a clear effect in, uh, in the environment and in society. Uh, so, so there, with regard to actions, these are entities that, that, that are perfect examples of your, uh, of, of your uh, case crossing these boundaries, which, however, I should is insist, exist. And, uh, uh, and, and with regard to, to Dunbar, why not even look into the brain and say, even within that brain, there might be boundaries too. Namely, there might be neuronal assemblies mm -hmm. that actually distinguish between entities, between the flower and the human and between humans of different kinds. And maybe that's the key to our brain evolution, namely that we as humans got more and more able to build, build up more and more uh, 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 such, if you wish, representations, such neuronal ensembles that actually allowed us to distinguish more and more entities in the environment. But this is a, a different kind of separation within the brain and outside. <laughs> no, that's, that's really helpful, and, and thanks, for, thanks for the comment, and I'll try to respond. Um, the, on the first one, um, your, your, claim, your point is, which is well taken, is that um, surely if you look at the, the full range of, a, of a, an individual's interactions, some are very intensive and some are not. And, um, and, and, and that may be true, but it's not necessarily the case that the intensive ones are with the conspecifics. I mean, um, you, you gave an example of, of, of uh, primates, chimpanzees, whatever, might be spending uh, many, many hours a day grooming <coughs> and each other, as indeed they do, um, perhaps not much time um, uh, getting food compared with the amount of time they spend grooming. Um, but uh, on the other hand, I could think of, of, of ethnographic uh, examples of people, particularly during certain seasons of the year, um, when... Uh, they might actually have very few other humans about um, and spend very little time with them, but be out almost all the time uh, hunting or fishing. Um, and, and so that, you know, it can, it can work both ways. You, could, you, you, you might have more intensive uh, interactions with conspecifics, but you might not. And, and a theory which um, works on the assumption that the intense interactions are always going to be with conspecifics can't, can't apply. Okay. I, I have a, I have a, if, if you allow me, I have a direct comment to that too. Of course, you are speaking, uh, you are speaking about humans which, which are evolved, which now have this huge brain. Right. If it's not just good for heating the body, uh, the brain, then, then it's, it, it might be good for other things, namely, to, and, and it's obviously very good at building up representations. So if but you are now burdened with this brain that constantly builds representations which had been evolved to, uh, to, uh, to, in, uh, to interact successively in a, in a larger society, th then it may well, th then this that might perfectly be accounts for the fact that in this specific situation where suddenly so society is missing, the, uh, the, 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 the single person but if you go in a small group would start to interact and take, take the, the tree and the flower and the, uh, okay. and the deer. Okay, but if you go to the non-human world, think of all the cases of close symbiosis, cross-specific symbiosis, uh, where it would be pretty hard to say that you could find a more intensive relationship. Actually, I, I, I should think, 
um, that it would be quite easy to find cases in the non-human animal kingdom of, of, of symbiosis where the intensity and time, time and space intensity of interaction with the symbiont is considerably greater than anything with fellow members of the same uh, species. Um, but just can I just get back to the thing about, about boundaries, because this is rather crucial. I, I, I think to answer it, we've got to be more precise than I was about different kinds of possible boundaries there might be. I mean, obviously, for example, within the brain, there are synaptic boundaries and thresholds and, and, and membranes and all sorts of things th across which um, currents are, 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 mo are, are passing. Um, so they're all, and, and if, if you're thinking of the, if you're thinking of the brain, well, I'm looking at the brain, then all sorts of stuff inside the brain wouldn't appear like boundaries. But if you took a finer grain, you might think of that as a boundary. Um, you, of, of course, in a sense, the brain ends somewhere, but an ending is not necessarily a boundary in the sense that I was meaning it. And I think that I was giving the, this boundary a kind of ontological weight um, that uh, is not so. So, you know, somebody like Bateson would say, of course, the, you know, the, the skin is a boundary, but stuff goes across it, and it's just one of a whole lot of boundaries. This is a classic example of a blind man walking down the street with a cane. You could say, well, there's the, there's the tip of the cane, there's the place where the cane meets your hand, there's the, uh, uh, this is at the skin, there are the boundaries inside the body of the brain. There are a whole series of boundaries, but the actual process, the flow, is, is going across all of those. Um, but I, I think the neuro, the, a lot of the neuroscience discourse, and specifically the sort that Dunbar is invoking there, is, is, um, is much more Cartesian. Descartes obviously had this idea of, of the, the brain tickling the mind. There's some mysterious transfer going on from the, the body brain to, to the mental apparatus. And that was a sort of, it was always been mysterious because it involves shifting over an ontological boundary. And, and, and I think that there's a, there's a certain kind of neurological, neuroscience discourse that is still invoking that kind of boundary. Okay, we have two more very brief questions. Uh, yep, Stephen Neville Knosis. Uh, we might say that we live in a time where we have a neurocentric biologization of the social going on. So, and we can criticize and have reservations towards us as you have us and I have. But can we also go the reverse way and talk about a socialization of the human biology and therefore dare to say that human communication, language, exchange, and have actually all of them formed the biology, even changed the brain. So uh, in order to get back about the land card of uh, politics of science, we could say as sociologists or anthropologists or cultural radical guys that we can tell something about how the brain was formed and then uh, yeah. go against this very heavy drive motive yeah. way highway of the first way of arguing, which is the neurocentric reductive uh, biologization of the social. Absolutely. I, 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 I think that's the way we need to go. It's, it's, it's taken quite a big... Uh, anthropologists have had to swallow very hard recently because they, you know, we've always worked with the idea that um, we're not interested in biological differences as such, we're interested in cultural differences, and so far as culture is concerned, biological differences such as they are make no, dif no, make no difference. Um, you know, they're all, that, that we can treat everybody alike biologically and then look at the cultural differences. And, and, and we've had to recognize that, um, that, that when people differ in their skills, for example, in, in, in the ways they walk or in the musical instruments they play or whatever kinds of skills they have, those, those differences affect the way their brains develop. And because the brain is, brain is so plastic, if you were able to look inside it, you would find neurological correlates of cultural difference. And that's been a big step for anthropology to take. Um, but it's, I think, more or less... Well, plenty of, pl plenty of us are taking it. And, and then the next step on from that is suddenly to realise that if we're interested in, in cultural di what we always call cultural differences, then, then, um, th 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 then neurological uh, considerations have got to be absolutely central to the account. It, it poses an enormous problem for us because it's so, the, the, the literature is so technical, so difficult. Um, it's very difficult for us to be able to say anything with any authority um, on, on the subject of, of the brain. But we've, we've come that far as to realize that, that we've got to have a, an integrated account. And that's been a big shift. 
Okay. Last question.